All right, well, hey, this is a new experience for the church here and for me also to have the uh, Sunday school lesson recorded and be playing for you guys, and I hope you join in. I'm going to start back with last Sunday school's lesson, not on Bible study, instead of this Sunday, and try to catch up from there. And, and today our lesson begins in Romans, the second chapter, verses 17 and following. Now, the, the title of this message today, our Sunday school lesson, is Insufficient. As I was studying this thing last week or two, I, I thought there's a, probably a better name for it, and that would be hypocrisy. And we all know that word. And, and the Jewish people, the, the leaders of the Jewish nation and all, they, they were hypocrites. You know, now I know the Lord was Jewish, the apostles were Jewish for the most part, and the early followers were Jewish, as supposed to be. And they, in turn, were supposed to be evangelists to the world. But somehow they got off track, and we know that, and that's what we want to really talk about today. Not so much their sincerity or insufficiency, as I think that they just dropped the ball in what they taught and what they believed. Now, they knew the Scripture. A couple of Jewish rabbis that I've had friendships with over the years are very intellectual people, and they know the Old Testament backwards and forwards. In fact, one of them was a uh, rabbi, and he had a doctorate degree in, in the study of Apostle Paul, of all things. Amazing. And I tried to, you know, talk with him about it. I couldn't even listen to what he was saying. It was so far above my head. But the Jewish people dropped the ball, figuratively speaking, and not following the text of the Word of God as it should have been followed and just decided they'd make their own reactions to it and their own desires. So, in verses 17 and following today, we're going to look at this, and we'll read a little along. In verse 17, 18, it says, Now, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the Lord, uh, on the law, and boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things of the superior, being instructed from the law, and if you're convinced that you are a guide for the blind, light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the embodiment of knowledge and truth in the law, you then who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach, you must not steal. Do you steal? You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob their temples? You who boast of the Lord and the law, excuse me, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And we've always heard this growing up in the church. Let's be a good witness. Let's be a great witness. And you know, I wonder if there's those out in the world that we have crossed paths with over the lifetime that we've lived thus far. I wonder how many of us have, have blasphemed God to our friends and neighbors in something we've said or did or didn't do, whatever. It's an awesome responsibility to live the Christian life. And I was going over that in my prayer time this morning, and God's really been dealing with my heart on faith. The faith that God has in us, first of all. Now, you just think about that. How many of us are even one-tenth as faithful to our friends and our relatives as God is to all those who belong to him? God never says, whoops. He never says, I'm not going to do this. I've got to think about this. God is faithful. Now, you know, there are a couple of words in theology uh, one is orthodoxy, which means right teaching, basically. And then there's another one called orthopraxy. I don't know me if us probably haven't heard that one, but you do if you go to seminary. And, and orthopraxy means right practice. Now, the Jewish people were orthodox. They knew the law. But the orthopraxy part was lacking terribly much. And, and what Paul is teaching us here is he's addressing our equal liability before God. It's not just our liability toward each other. We ultimately, we have a responsibility to act before God in a Christian manner. And this is what Paul is boiling it down to. He addressed their liability before God. You know, a lot of people join a church, and I'm going back to what I've been studying and pondering and thinking about, and that's faith. It takes faith to become a Christian, but I'm going to tell you something else. It takes faith to live the Christian life. Now, so many people drop that part of the ball. They want the faith that brings them to Christ, but they don't live that faith life. They are no less or no greater sinners 
than those Jewish people who felt that they had given everything and that if it had not for them, nothing would happen in the Gentile world or even in their own world. So Paul is saying all of us are accountable to God. And you know, so many people come and join the church and then they drop out, as we say. We know that's praise. Why do they do that? I can't answer that. I have some good friends whose grandchildren have dropped out of faith. I have faith, I have grandchildren myself that sometimes they get lazy and they're not being faithful to God for one reason or the other, and it breaks my heart when they do that. And some, not my grandchildren, but some children and grandchildren have just walked away from God altogether. And I think about all these little children that come here and these young adults and all that, that become Christian, and, and I know they're being taught right here, and I know their parents are bringing them to church. Everything is being done we can do possibly to keep them accountable to God, as Paul says we all must be. But let's face it, let's be honest, some of them are going to drift away. They're not going to be faithful to God. Now, I, I, I'm confident that you and I believe that people can drift away from God and stop living for Christ for a while, maybe. But I don't know anywhere in the Bible that it says a man cannot walk with God and claim to be a Christian for 40 years, never go to church, never serve the Lord from the day of their salvation, they claim, until the day of their death. But, oh, they they were on a roll somewhere. A lady told me that this past week over the phone about her children. And it, it is sad, but that's just not where God is wanting us to be. Now, we're accountable to God even if we're not Jewish people or even if we are Jewish people. You see, it doesn't matter what our nationality is or what our color is or what our economic situation is or what our educational situation is. I, I've known people who could quote the New Testament to you, but they didn't know God. And I've known people that could pray the greatest prayers and couldn't read, had no ability, they weren't educated. But boy, when they prayed, people knew God was there. You see, it, it matters more of our relationship to God than what our nationality is or educational level or anything else. Mankind, all mankind, are accountable and all are guilty before God. And that's what Paul is trying to get these Jewish people to see there in the church. They were looking down on the Gentile people. And they thought they were superior to everyone else because of their birth and what nationality they were. And so their hypocrisy is what I said to begin with. This revealed. Now, you don't have to look far to see those who are living a hypocritical life, do you? You don't have to check them out, so to speak. You see by the way they live their daily life that they're hypocrites, that they claim to be something for God, but they're not. Now, Paul said, look, you think the law is the way to go. But Paul is the one who said to us that the law was a schoolmaster, but it wasn't the final principle. And, and those who look at the law to make one righteous, it, it should motivate people to seek God's pardon and design, pardon and design, and, and desire that kind of righteousness. But we know that the law is not going to bring us to salvation. And that's what Paul is trying to get the Jewish people in the church at Rome to understand. Now, we look back again at verses 17 and 18. I love how he's just hammering this, this point home. Now, if you call yourself a Jew, and you know this, and you do this, and you do that, you can do every bit of that. You may think you're superior, but you still need Christ. Without Christ, it doesn't matter how much you know. You don't know the Savior, and that's what's so important. So he's using that collective pronoun, you. He meant all the Jewish people, not just two or three, not just those he knew personally, but this was, this was speaking to all of them. And Jewish law cannot make, it never was intended to make, a Jew righteous or anyone else. We know as Christians that we all fail God. We all break the commandments. And I've heard people say, well, I broke all of them but one or two. Well, the truth be known, it probably broke that too because Jesus said if you have hatred in your heart, you, you, you know, you call yourself this and that, but you're a fool and you're lost for doing that. You don't know Christ. You can't harbor hatred like that among yourself. And so he said, you claim all these spiritual distinctions. Why aren't you living that kind of lifestyle? And I, I love how he just hammered home on this. And I really think that the church needs to hear this more. I, I know that we got the 
preach these messages at times that are encouraging, and boy, I need that, and all of you need that. But more important, we need to be certain that we are walking with God as we should. A good friend of mine who was a counselor retired now, Hal Threadcraft, he spoke at our church, and he spoke at our, uh, one of our marriages conferences a few years ago. One of the kindest men I've ever met. And I would send all of, all of my former members to him for counseling. I would tell him, I'll talk to you one time, but Hal is educated in this. He knows how to do it. He's been doing it for years. And I, I want to recommend you go see him. I didn't want to send anybody in my fellowship of believers to, to a counselor who would say, well, just get a divorce or, you know, it's okay to, you know, if you committed adultery or you cannot be an alcoholic and all that. No, you can't. You got to live your walk, not just walk. And that's what we just keep hammering on here. And they, and Paul does too. Now there were three or four things that, that Paul says they should be. First of all, you, you should guide the blind. You should be a guide for the blind. It, it, I say this a lot, and I know you're probably tired of hearing it, but when I was in the military, and I went in the first, in the Navy the first two or three years, and I remember the first time I walked on a ship, there was a boatswain mate there, and I was an E-2 or something like that, and he said to me, we were getting underway, and he said, Flemish, that rope. And I looked around at all the other ropes, and I didn't know what it meant to Flemish, a rope. Or maybe you knew, you know that or knew that. And I, I just had to say, look, I don't know what you mean. I was scared to death to do that. I was a kid, 18 years old. Here's this big old boat was made. He turned out to be a great guy. He said, here's what I mean by Flemish in a rope. And he explained it. When you call it up and lay it out on the, on the deck and you just keep making circles and circles and circles and it gets wider and longer and all that until you get to the end of the rope. But I didn't know that. You see, he could tell me to flimish that rope all day long, but I had to understand that, and he had to demonstrate that to me. I became, over the time I was in the Navy, a pretty good seaman because there was somebody teaching me how to do that. Our young people, our adults, they go back to school, or they go to school, and they learn a trade, and they come out and teach the world that trade, or they participate in making that trade come to pass in the workplace. But somebody had to teach them, and they in turn taught others. Paul says, look, you claim that you are a guide for the blind, that you're light for the darkness, that, that you're a corrector of the foolishness because they, they didn't favor the Lord, or you're a teachers of the immature. All these things, Paul says, you know, you've talked to these about that thing, but you're not following your own advice. How about you? Are you following the advice of the Word of God? If you're like me, I, I, I guarantee you'll instantly say, not like I want to, not like I should. I, I really, you know, had a quiet time this morning with the Lord and meditation and praying and reading. And I began to grieve in my own heart, as you do. You know what I'm talking about. I begin to say, Lord, particularly in my case, you know, I'm a minister of the gospel. I should be telling others how it is to be that kind of person, what that means. And yet, Lord, in, in 55 years of ministry now, 55 years, I look back at the first time I ever walked into the door of the first church I ever pastored, the first class I ever taught, all that. And I look back now, 55 years down the road, and, and, and you know, I, I don't know that I've made a lot of progress. I, I, I need to be those who guide the blind and teach the foolish and uh, share information with them, be a light to them. And I'm afraid too many times I've not been. Now, so, so many people in the church are kind to us ministers. I, I'll tell you they are, really. You're going to run into a few over the years that will irritate you and, and, and criticize you and all that, but for the majority, people love on us. And, and, and it's wonderful. That in our fellowship here at Chapel Hill, I don't know any church that loves its staff better than this church. And so I say this morning to God, and I've said it before, God, I'm not a good example of a Christian. I'm really not what I want to be. Are you? Are you really the Christian that you know you should be? But don't tell me you don't want to be that. I don't believe that. I know you want to believe that. I know you want to live that kind of life. 
because I'm not alone in this world, and I, I live with preachers seven days a week in this city, and they all say the same thing. We all feel like we're not what we need to be for God. Well, if we're not walking the talk, then we, in essence, are not revealing God to the world. And, and we're saying, here's what you need to be, but you know that old adage, don't do as I do, but do as I say. That doesn't fly with Christianity. You cannot say, well, just do as I do, and, and don't pay attention to what I do. Oh, man, what a terrible witness that really is, isn't it? That wouldn't hold water with God. God's not pleased with that when we do that way. And so Paul said, you've been instructed from the law. That means you've been approved by the law to examine a matter, to determine its validity. You know how to say this, but you're not living the life that you know you should be living. So the law does not make one righteous. And then we are hypocrites. If we're saying to others, do what I tell you to do and don't do what you see me do, that's, that's a terrible thing. I can't imagine any vocation that would be worth a dime, no matter how well trained those people were, if they never performed the duties they've been trained to do. Some people are great painters, some people are great theologians, some people are great professors or accountants or whatever. But what value is that ability if they don't utilize it and help others through that. So when Paul said in 19 and 20 what I've just mentioned, you know, you're to guide, you're to light, you're to instruct, and you're to teach. That's a good way to outline what we're to do in our life. Guide, instruct, light, and teach the world out here. Tell them what, how wonderful it is that we know Christ and how wonderful it is and how much it means to us. I had a, a man... I don't know what age he was back then. He, he was probably, would be a young man. And he had a, had a divorce. He was an alcoholic. And I loved that guy. I still love him today. He's been dead a long time. And to be honest with you, I cannot remember his name. But back in those early days of seminary and college, I was single. He was single. And I don't know how I finally met him. It got him coming to church. As long as I stayed in touch with him, he'd show up. But if I happen to be gone for a week or two, the first thing I know, he'd be back on the bottle again. His mother would be calling me with broken heart again. His family was devastated by the way he was living his life. And you know, it's sad to say, he never, to my knowledge, he never did break that, that sinful lifestyle. He worked hard. He was working, contracting, hard worker. But then he may be gone for a month. On, on drinking and things like that, and it just didn't work. And I've grieved over his life so many times since then, and that's what I, I want to do. I want to be caring for people like him. You can't care for everybody like that, but I want to be caring for all people to the ability I can be. And, and I know that you do too. We have a wonderful church here that loves to care for people. And there are those in our church that need care, and they're not just sick. They're, they're not feeble and old. There are people in this church that are just tired. They're fearful. They're worried. They're anxious. They have problems. We need to look around and see those we can minister to in this church. There's always opportunities out there. And I know what you think. Well, I just can't do anymore. I, I'm doing all I can do right now. I got my own family to take care of. And I understand that. And God understands that. You don't have to take care of all five or six, seven hundred members of this church. But maybe there's one you could. Maybe there's one you could pick up that can't drive anymore, doesn't have transportation. Maybe there's one you could call. Surely we could do that. We could have a phone prayer ministry. You could. And I don't mean you have to call everyone. Why don't you pick out one or two or five and make that your ministry to minister to those people and care for them as you should. And so Paul had described a, a, a good deal of positive qualities. And Paul brought his point to bear. He said, you then who teach another, don't you teach yourself? I'm not a school teacher, but I think it's a great vocation. I think you, you teachers out there in our church, and you have a great opportunity to, to 
help the character of those young people and children. And oh, how they need it, because some of them don't get it anywhere else except there. And I think you have a tremendous responsibility. And by the way, I'm not running for office, but I think you ought to have double what you're paying. The, the teachers are hard-working people. I don't know anybody that puts in more hours. And it doesn't just quit when school is over. You've got to make sure the buses get out. You've got to work the football and other athletic games. You've got to go to this and do this and have, have all these things going on for your children and your class. You're grossly underpaid, in my opinion. And I don't have a kid in there that teaches school, never had one. I've never taught school. But I just look around and all that's going on in, in their lives and all the responsibility you have to help them. I, I, I envy you that opportunity. And I know in our own church, our children's minister, we have so many children saved. Why? First of all, because dad and mom, you bring them to church. That wouldn't happen if you wasn't teaching them it's important. Second of all, because of our ministry to them through this church and through Rob, they get saved. I mean, we had, I think, 36 last year that were baptized here, I believe. But whatever it is, it's wonderful. And you're being responsible. We're being responsible. We love them. And because of that, they love the Lord Jesus Christ. My little granddaughter, great-granddaughter, just turned six Thursday. You're talking about somebody loves to come to church. And all children do. I've never seen a child that got up on Sunday morning that was that age and couldn't wait to get to church. That's the way she is. And she comes home and she's singing those little songs that she's learned in children's church that day. And she's telling us something about the lessons from Bible study or Sunday school. Forgive me, I'm, I'm old. I'm, I come up under the Sunday school title. And, and that's the way it should be. We are teaching and we're, we're saying to another, I know how important this is because I've got it, and I'm happy I've got it, and I want you to have it too. Don't just be a teacher without any practice about it. Practice what you teach so others will know it. So he described, Paul does, some things, and one thing he basically is suggesting that they were immature in a sense that they were putting down on the Gentiles, making light of their intelligence and their wisdom and all about life. Listen, I, I've talked to people who are not the brightest in the world. Some of them may have some special needs. I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about maybe special needs mentally. Maybe they can't quote things like you can. Maybe they've never read Shakespeare, in my opinion, excuse me, literature teachers. You can live without knowing Shakespeare. But you know, they were just saying, oh, you're, 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 you can't be like us. We're just special people. Well, I'm not special, and you're not special. But why can we not share Christ with others boldly? Because we know what it's all about, but not to the point of saying, hey, I've got it. You need it. No. Say, hey, listen, I've come to Christ, and you need to come to Christ, and I want to I wanna help walk you through that process. So Paul says in 21 and 22, if you teach, teach another. Teach yourself. You're preaching. You ought to do what you say. Walk the talk. That's what Paul is saying to us today in this lesson. It is so important. We've gotten away from that. Today, hypocrisy is, is, is okay. It's okay to be hypocrisy. And you know, Paul, God says that people can so sin and so walk away from him and he'll just give them up and listen that's what's going on in our world today our transgender population our homosexual population alcoholic population our drug population our unconcerned population these people god many times they're past coming to christ now you know probably the first thing you'll say is how are you going to know that i don't know i think you'll see it all their life my stepfather, my dad died when I was two years old. My mom remarried when I was five. And he was a good man. He supported that family. He'd never been married before. But he wouldn't go to church. That was just out of it. And when I became a minister, I tried to witness to him. And you know what he said to me? It broke my heart. He said, I live with you. I know who you are. Boy, that's like taking a knife and stabbing yourself in the heart. And it broke my heart. I said, you know, I have got to live a better life around him. And I tried over years to try to get him interested. Never could do it. 
And he would go to funerals if it was somebody really, really he liked and was close to a co-worker or something. But you know what? He'd never go into church at the funeral. I don't know, I guess he thought it might swallow him up or something. He'd stand outside the whole funeral. And that's where he made all of his time, right there. And he'd leave once the casket came out, was loaded up, they went to the cemetery. He wouldn't go to the cemetery. But I wasn't proud of this, but one of my sisters told me not long ago, a year or so, it seems like, that somebody finally got to him. And I know who it was. It wouldn't matter to you who it was. He, he was a minister, and he was well thought of. He didn't live in our town anymore, but he was a well thought of man. And I hope that's true. I hope before he had that last heart attack that he asked Christ into his heart. And you know, that's what it's all about. We're not just living for ourselves out here. The old song, you remember it? Living for Jesus, faithful and true. That's what we're to be. We're to be faithful and true to our faith. So you see, faith is not just coming to Christ. Faith is walking with Christ. That's part of life as a Christian. Now, Paul had described a number of what should have been positive qualities that Paul brought his point to bear on. And so if they were such exemplary people, then they ought to be able to help others become exemplary Christians also. So, you know, we can't just talk it, folks. We can't do it. That's a hypocrisy. Now, on the outside, the Jewish man would despise, or woman, despise idolatry. In their hearts, though, they long for the treasure found in a pagan temple. They'd steal it. That's what was important to them. They, they thought it was okay to, to get that money and use it for themselves. It was pagan. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything to do with God. But, of course, they, they, didn't, they didn't think that was wrong to hate paganism or to hate homosexuals or that. Listen, I know people who have children who are transgenders and, and, and they're homosexuals. And, you know, I've had two or three of them. One of them, one of them is the mother of a preacher friend of mine. Not here. He's retired, lives in North Alabama. But it's been such a burden on that family that the daughter has become a transgender person, has joined a church in a transgender environment, and they worship God. Maybe they do. I don't know. But all I know is that's not what God would have us to do. And, and, and you may come at me the next time you see me and say, I just disagree with you. I understand that. But I don't know how one can practice faith and live unfaithful. Now, maybe you do. And maybe God will continue to forgive that sin when they know it's a sin. The Bible says him who knows the sin and sin, it's wrong. It's wrong. And so there's that transgender girl, and she called her grandfather preacher and was talking to him about it. He said, he called her name, and it was a girl's name. He said, listen, dear, all over this house right here, ever since you've been a baby, and the picture's hung here, you have always been a girl. And now you believe that God made you to be a man. I don't know anywhere in the Word of God it says that God changes his mind of, about our sex after we're born. I don't hear that anywhere. I don't think you do. And it's just shattered that girl's mother shattered her father and her brother and her other sister, and it just breaks their heart because this is a tight, godly group of people. And, and his oldest daughter went on mission trips with my wife and I, and he went, and it just breaks my heart to see this. I never have known the daughter. But you see, to a degree, Paul was right. The Jewish people were right because the nations didn't understand, didn't have a clear understanding of God. And God intended for Israel to testify about that, and the tragedy was they were not testifying properly about that. So Paul's final question was really to be understood as a summation. You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So Paul is, is summarizing it here. And these Jewish people who boast in the law, they were so proud of themselves. They were so proud that they had been entrusted with God's word 
And they honestly believed the Mosaic law set them apart as God's chosen people. And instead of treating the law of God as a standard by which they should have gauged their own conduct, they had isolated it as a symbol of spiritual dominance. Spiritual dominance. Have you ever seen people on TV or people you know in your life that were just arrogant? They, they just, they thought so well of themselves they couldn't even wear their own clothes scared they might get them dirty, you know? That, that's people out there like that. They just so stuck on themselves. And that's the way the Jewish people were living. They were so stuck on themselves. I get around Jewish people, I, I am really, now I'm not just saying this, I am humbled. I'm humbled. In some way that I really can't maybe express it and define it. But I will often say to a Jewish person, maybe I run, run into them on a cruise or on a vacation and, and it's a group thing like we go off in groups in our church here. And I say, boy, I, I, I just love you Jewish people. The last one I said that to were in uh, somewhere in Brazil, I think it was, or somewhere in South America. And he come back to me immediately and said, well, we love you Christians too. And, and I, you know, I grew up there with some Jewish people in our town, not many. When I was in Rotary in Tuscaloosa here for a while, and there was a Jewish guy in there, Paul Applebaum. He passed away a few years ago. A wonderful guy. He was a jokester. He always come in and knew that I liked good jokes. So he'd try to find one or two every week to share with me. I love Paul. He had a business here for years and years in the shoe business. And they're, they're good people. They're not bad people. But the devil has just blinded them. Isn't, isn't it what Christ says? That one day their eyes are going to be open and they're going to see what they should have been and what they are and can be now. Oh, they don't understand that. But we Christians understand that. And we're saying, oh God, I hope it's soon because there's a lot of good Jewish people out there that are good husbands and good fathers and good business people and good workers and good citizens. They're, they're just like everybody else except their hearts are blinded. Me, I'm, the Jewish faith is a religion to them, but that's all. It's a political religion to them, even. And many of those politicians that are Jewish are not the followers of the Jewish faith. Now, I don't know a percentage on that, but I, I'm just kind of optimizing that statement, and maybe I shouldn't have. Well, Paul questioned whether having elevated the place of the law, they were at the same time breaking it and dishonoring God by the way they live. It's just simple, folks. We either have to live for God or we're not living for God. There are no middle grounds out there. We are Christians or we are not Christians. We are of faith or we are not of faith. And, and you know, I, I've tried to witness to people, and it, it's happened here not long ago. I can't recall where. And, and everybody's saved today. You ever noticed that? Everybody say, and there was a couple and their children who came to this church for a while. And in fact, this this young man did some work for me some time ago, carpentry work. And another friend of his who was a Christian but and is a deacon in another church, he said, "You know who that is?" And I said, "No, now I do." And so the next Sunday, they didn't come all the time, maybe once a month or so. The next time they came, I went back and they were sitting on the back row back there, right in front of the sound booth. And I t called them by name, and I said, boy, it's good to see you guys today. And I said, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to come by and talk to you. Could I do that? And he put his hand up by his eyes like that, and he thought, thought, thought. I thought, well, he's not going to let me come. And he said, I guess so. I guess so. And I'm not gone. That's my bad. And I thought, well, he is just totally not interested. But I'm glad he didn't say, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm glad he didn't say that because those are the ones. Let me tell you, those people who think they're all right with God are the ones you can't reach for no amount of money or time. They're just not going to believe that they're that bad off, that they need a God, a Christ, a Savior. They just can't understand. I'm, I'm sure you know people like that too. But I've said this, and I've convicted myself, and I'm going to call that guy. I'm going to go by and visit him. I've, been, I've probably been thrown out of better houses than the one he's living in, and I don't even know where he lives. But you see, there are those people out there that just believe they're okay where they are. And when you read the Scriptures, you just, just get a burden for those people. You know what they're missing. And, and, and you see, none of us, as I've said already, can keep every point of the law. We simply can't do it. 
and, 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 and we actually expect perfection among others, don't we? You think that, that the staff here ought to be perfect because we're on staff. But listen, that doesn't mean we're perfect. Let's ask one of us about one of the others, and they'll tell you how quickly that we're not perfect. <laughs> so one of them back there listens to that. And, and, and it's true. We all have our oddities, and we all have our breakdowns and our burdens, and, and we know it's a growing process, and we want to be in that process. We want to grow. And, and so we understand we, we, we're unable to keep the law at every point. And that's why we need a Savior, because we cannot manufacture our goodness because of keeping the law. Our perfection doesn't come by keeping the law. So that's what he talks about. I'm going to close here. He talks about circumcision. And, and, and you understand this. You've been around. You've heard lessons. And he said circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. But if you're a lawbreaker, our circumcision has become uncircumcision. Now what's he saying there? All right, if you believe that that circumcision is a sign that you've kept every point of the law, great, you have just won yourself the key to heaven. But, there's that but, that conjunction in there, but if you are a lawbreaker and who's not, then you are really not circumcised. What's he talking about? He's not talking about a physical circumcision. Yes, that was a physical sign that you are a Jewish person. But he said you need to be uncircumcised in the heart. If you're uncircumcised in the heart, then you're going to be a true Christian, a true follower of God. So if an uncircumcised man keeps the law of requirement, will not his uncircumcision be counted circumcision? Man who is physically uncircumcised but who keeps the law, will you judge, will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law? So here's some guy here in the world that has kept every law, not broken one of the Ten Commandments. Now, we know that's not possible, but just, just suppose there was. Then that person, male or female, would have every right in the world to say, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I am a Christian because I've kept the law. And you're wrong because you've been circumcised physically, but you've never been circumcised spiritually. So you're not the one who's telling me how to be a Christian. I'm telling you, if you keep the law, you can do it. But no, it's just a schoolmaster. You know, I can walk around with an algebra book in my hand, which I did for a couple of years, but I guarantee you I am not a math whiz. I'm not an algebra scientist. I couldn't teach algebra in kindergarten. I, I, I just couldn't do it. But yet people out there that think because they've not robbed anybody or killed anyone and all those kind of things, oh, no, they make their own private list. They got their own list, I guarantee you. Now, if they've committed adultery, you're not going to ever hear them say, I've never committed adultery, and on and on. If you've ever stolen, they're not going to say, well, I've never stolen anything. They're going to tell you the things that they've not done that makes them feel good about themselves. Well, they may feel good about themselves, but feeling good about yourself is not salvation. So he says then in verse 28, for a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. All right, man, we are Baptists. We have our name on the roll here at this church. And that's great, and that's good. But we're not a Christian because we're a Baptist any more than a Catholic is a Christian because they're Catholic or any other denomination. And, and there's some denominations that are truly not of the faith, whatever they may call themselves. But the key denominational people out there, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Apostolic, Pentecostals, those are the ones I'm speaking of. So we may be long to any one of those denominations, and we may be on the board, as one of my deacons, we always used to call it the board, you know, so that was some status symbol if you were on the board. We don't, I don't hear that much anymore. But, you know, just because we're Baptist and maybe you're a deacon or maybe we're great Sunday school teachers or musicians, that's not salvation. And I, there's a lot of Baptists out there that don't understand that. You know, Billy Graham once made a statement, and it was a speculation. It wasn't a scientific thing. He said, probably, I think he used that word, it's been many years ago, 75% 
of those who call themselves Christian or not. That's an astronomical number. He didn't say Baptist. He's a Baptist. He didn't say Presbyterian because his wife is that. He just said 75% of those who are, think they're Christian call themselves Christians or not. Now, if 75% of our people that are faithful to this church are not Christians, that really knocks a hole in the number. You know, for the first time as Baptists, we're beginning to see a decline, a real decline. And that's troubling to me. And I don't know if it says something about me as a minister or does it say something about the world today? Is there just a coldness in our society? Yes, I think there is. But does that excuse me not going to that person's house that barely invited me to do that? Because, I'm, I, you know, I can go talk to him about football and we'll get along fine. I can talk about him where he works and I don't know where he works and how much he likes it and, boy, you got a good living. That's a great place to work. Well, you start talking to someone about Christ, sometimes they'll just show you the door. One of my old professors went to visit a man he'd been asked to see. And he went up there and he was very proper in his manner. Very, very old school. And he went up there to talk to the man. He said, I'm here to talk to you about the Lord today. He said, the man just threw his finger out and pointed. And he said, why, Ken? I thought he was pointing at somebody was coming up the driveway behind me. He said, I looked around, there was nobody there. He said, he put his finger out there again and pointed at it. And it dawned on me, what he was saying to me was, get out of my door. I don't have time to listen to this. Don't want to do it. And he died without knowing Christ. But you know, I've said it. You probably said it. But it's true. I don't have to win them to Christ to be a witness. Now, I remember that. You don't have to be a winner of souls to be a witness. You just have to be a testifier of Christ. You share Christ where you work. You invite them to something special or just say something good about your church in that present. As we're going through this year now, you know, who's your one? Find one that's your one and develop that relationship with that one until the place comes and he will or she will let you do that one day if they love you and know you love them, that you can sit down with them and talk about Christ. That's what we must start doing. I must start doing most of that. And so... A person who is really a Jew is one inwardly, inwardly, because they walk the talk. They live the life. That's what it's all about right there. And that's what Paul's saying. You see, praise that matters comes not from people, but from God. So that person's praise, Paul says in 29, is not from people. If, if God is praising you, it's because you are loving him. And that's what's important. Just performing religious works in order to garner human praise, that's not going to save you. God's not interested in your human praise. He's interested in your human heart, working and living for him. Now, let me, let me close, summarize. Number one, we have said the law cannot make one righteous. Now, I know that when I learn something. I have to go back over it and over it to keep remembering. So remember that. Number two, circumcision cannot make one righteous. And three, being born a Jew will not make one righteous. What will make one righteous? Knowing the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to teach your word. And I pray that all of us have a better understanding, Lord. Every time I read these passages, it convicts me. And I know what I need to do. I need to walk closer to you and be more faithful to you. And to live out my calling that you called all of us to. Every one of us have a calling. Help me to be faithful to do the calling that you've asked me to do. Thank you for this church and for the fellowship of believers that goes here. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.